So my name is Jared. Um, you may follow me on GitHub for Twitter, at Jared Palmer, basically anywhere you go. Uh, I write JavaScript. and Well, actually, I write TypeScript, but I write JavaScript is the way I think about it. And over the past, call it two years or so, have been working on a pretty large server rendered uh, universal JavaScript ap application uh, for work. And um, uh, it's taken me on a long road, and we're going to sort of go through that road. But uh, this is me on GitHub. I have some other projects you may, might have used or might, might want to check out. Formic, it's a form library for React. Uh, Razzle, which we're going to talk about later today. Uh, Backpack is uh, mostly for building APIs and microservices. And uh, React FNS is a um, collection of utility functions for React. So if you're a React person, you can probably figure that out. I am. Uh, that's my religion. Um, I, uh, I subscribe. And hopefully, you might find my tools useful. So yeah, it's a cool logo wall that I have. I'm getting good at these marketing logos, I guess. I don't know. So I work at the Palmer Group. Uh, we uh, help companies with what we call digital transformation. And what that means is you take a company that may or may not be taking advantage of all the fun tools we get to use. Um, and maybe they don't um, have the ability to recruit an engineering team. And we come in, we help them not only with like digital strategy, but also with upgrading their infrastructure, front end. Anything that can be automated will automate. And so the services and tools that I build in open source are in service to that. So what's cool about my job is when I open source a tool, it's because I'm using it. And when, I, when people like submit PRs or find bugs, it's in my best interest to go fix that because it's something that I use day to day and that is used on client projects all the time. So it also means that the stuff that I do publish is pretty battle tested. So it's not just like oftentimes a weekend hack or something like that. So we're hiring. So if you're awesome at JavaScript too, and well, maybe even TypeScript as well, come see me after the fact. So back to server render JavaScript. So I was building this app, building and have been building this application. And it's before we kind of get into looking at some sites, we need to make some distinctions and level set about content. So I like to think about content in two ways. There's dynamic content and static content. Static content can be generated ahead of time. Uh, it doesn't change very often, thinking like what's and what's often. I mean like several times a day maybe. Um, or there's so much of it that like it's impossible for the pages to maybe be regenerated. Um, this is how WordPress works in PHP. Every single time you load a page in WordPress, which it will hit the database out of the box and find some information, print the page. Um, it, there's no index.html. That's on a dynamic content. With static content, you could basically have some piece of static content. It could be served up from an S3 bucket. Uh, and there's some cool things that um, static content can let you do. Uh, you don't have to worry about security as much. You uh, don't have to worry about scaling your server or anything like that. But it has some downsides as well. So most of the um, static site generators, if you've heard that term before, are little services or helper, func helper libraries that will you know, help you pump out a blog, like a Jekyll, um, or recently Gatsby's got become really popular. And those are great for your marketing blog, potentially all your marketing pages. And you're seeing a lot of sites go there too. And even some news sites start to do that. The problem with it is you have to regenerate the entire page. And when you make a change, like you change the nav bar, for example, now you have to change and regenerate every single page of your application. So if you've got a small enough application, it's not a big deal. You can just, you know, maybe you have a Lambda function that can do it. But if you have thousands of pages, like the New York Times, you're not going to be able to regenerate every single page very quickly. So, and we don't know necessarily, you know, there's two different kinds of changes. One might be a data change, or one might be a stylistic change. And without some intelligent stuff that mm, is really super bleeding edge and not really ready yet, you wouldn't know whether you need to just regenerate that one page or regenerate all the pages. So that's why sites like Airbnb and New York Times and BBC are still doing dynamic server rendering, or SSR, as we, as we like to call it. So I was, again, I was building this application. And this was, again, about a year ago. And the options I had were Next.js, um, Angular Univ Universal, or Nuxt. And Nuxt is like Next. Uh, and I was a really early adopter of, ne of Next. As I mentioned, I'm into React, so there really was only one option at that point. Um, or I would roll something on my own. And 
around the same time, Create React App, if you're familiar with that, also came out. And this was the idea of, instead of another boilerplate, let's abstract away our build tool and make something that is zero config that can be repurposed and reused across um, uh, projects. So again, coming from Palmer Group, we have a lot of projects. So something like that kind of made sense to me. I liked the, some of the ideas in Next.js, but what I didn't like about Next.js uh, is that it, has, it makes some decisions for you that I wasn't so sure about. It makes some decisions about the way you fetch your data. It makes some decisions about the way you handle your routing in your application. Um, and it makes, and it, but it, it abstracts away the, tool, the tooling. All the Webpack stuff is completely taken care of. So that's really cool. But ultimately, uh, and I was an early contributor, it just wasn't working out. The churn was too hard. And I had this pretty popular boilerplate on GitHub that I had been using and sort of got some inspiration over, the one, over one weekend and was like, OK, I think I can, based on Create React App and looking at some source code of Next, I think I can, I think I can do this. So that's what I did. And eventually, I came up with something called Razzle. And the goal was I want to have the same developer experience as Create React App has, which is this awesome yeah, you Create React App, my project, and boot up, you're ready to go in 35 seconds. I wanted that experience, but with truly universal JavaScript and universal React specifically. And, prior, and I wanted hot module replacement. I wanted all the DX that Create React App had, but with universal code. And that was the aim of the project. So with that, it's time for demos. Um, and but just to pull, push on the point here about what kinds of application, what kind of sites we're talking about for that, that are good candidates to use Razzle. So Gatsby again, this is a static static site generator. If we go to Stripe's dashboard, you know, if your app starts with dashboard or app dot, this conversation that we're about to have is not as potentially useful. But what I will say is the the philosophy and architecture behind Razzle. Is, pro is, you know, is, is will can be found interesting to you because of the way it stays agnostic about the frameworks, and we'll get to that later. So if you're not doing this kind of like uh, site like bbc.com, for example, um, this article, they really want SEO. They want this to be shareable on Facebook. They want, uh, when you view source, they want these meta tags to be there. And because the BBC has thousands and thousands of pages, it's not reasonable for them to regenerate their entire site or even potentially all um, parts of their site in a timely fashion as fast as the news cycle. Um, so Razzle's used in production. We're going to show that in a second. But it's used in production on some cool sites. It's used on cars.com, so shopping for my Rolls Royce, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's, it's ra ra this is built with Razzle. Um, and what's cool is that actually cars.com, some, their, their, some of their Razzle stuff is published on GitHub, too. Uh, Coinbase.com uses it as well on their marketing side, so their public-facing sites. And we use it in a, a bunch of our applications as well. So um, Jared Palmer slash Razzle on GitHub. And the, the, the catchphrase is, create server-rendered universal JavaScript applications with no configuration. And we'll get to that in a second. So when you boot up Razzle, what's cool about it is it's a single dependency. And it's a, de uh, it's a developer de a dev dependency. Here it is right here. And you can install using Yarn Create, Yarn Create Razzle app, just like you would with React app, and boot up uh, an application in no time. Again, it's just, or you can just add it to your app, existing application. And so let's start this up, uh, Yarn Start. And you'll notice on the side here, can we all see that? Can I zoom in more? You'll notice on the side here, there's not a lot of files to get started. There's an Express server, which looks like an Express server. And if you were to go to the React docs and look at how you do server rendering, it's pretty close to exactly how they have it there. You just call render to string. And instead of reading from a file, here's my template. Razzle will handle all, where the, all the assets, JavaScript, and boom, React markup. Export default server. That's it. That's all you have to do. And here's my app. It's a little React component. And my client is going to mount React and around with uh, React Router. Uh, and that's all she wrote. So let's see what that actually looks like here. So some React code. And when I make changes, let's go over here a little bit. And when I make changes to this code, 
some awesome React code, and press Save. Boom. Now, what's cool about this is this is not like turned off. This is writing, this is some React code, right? And what's great about that is when I press refresh, this is server rendered. So view source works exactly as you expect it, um, which doesn't seem super magical now. But the, to get here, Razzle has to do some pretty interesting stuff. So create React app, and a lot of the SPA stuff you're probably used to has one instance of Webpack running. The way Razzle works is it actually has two instances of Webpack running. One instance is responsible for bundling your client code, and the other one is responsible for bundling your server code. Uh, they have, so there are two entry points. First is client.js, which is where you mount React. And the second is actually index.js. And this code actually allows the server to hot reload the same way your client application would hot reload. So you get all the benefits of hot module replacement, which is that really fast save I just showed you. And you also get um, on both the server and the client. So the default for Razzle is React. But it can be used, and after I built this, I, I sort of started to realize this, it can be used for other things. Because ultimately, it's just a really nice configuration of Webpack. So with Razzle's API, you get the full ability to like, get closer to the metal, which is not that close, but to closer to the metal. So you can customize Webpack however you want. And so you can, for example, use Razzle with Reason React. Um, and so here's, some, here's a Razzle app that's built with Reason. Let's start this one up. And it's compiling. But yeah, some Reason code. And re the way Reason works is there's a buckle script compiler. And if you ever play with this, it will, it's really fast. And what it does is it ends up compiling your Reason code. If you've never seen Reason, this is how it looks, um, into JavaScript. And then you import that JavaScript back into your application. Um, you can see the JavaScript will be outputted here. Or here you go, ES6 Global. So you import that back into your application. Here's my, here's my app that's written in Reason. And when I make changes in Reason, let's go find this counter code. We'll call this counters. It will just update. You don't have to think about it. So again, so because the build system's abstracted, you get a lot of power. And to show you just how much power you get from abstracting your build system and remaining mostly framework agnostic, we're going to go on a journey of an application. So we already had this React app, but now we're going to get wild and add Vue to our application. So we're going to have React and Vue with universal server rendering on the same page at the same time uh, with Razzle. So let's boot that up. So Razzle X allows you to, I, I said before, like get access to the underlying Webpack configs. And you do that by starting up, uh, adding a razzle.config.js file. And you can just have at your Webpack config. So this is me adding Vue to the existing React app that Razzle starts with. Um, don't need to get into it too much, but it's just modifying Webpack if you've ever I think I could change my LinkedIn to professional webpack configurator at this point, but like I hope you but I hope that you don't have to. And so this is pretty nuts. So this app, we'll look at it in a second, is gonna boot up. We're on port 3000, so let's refresh here. So I got Vue and React on the same page. How did that work? Well, I imported Vue from this is my server, and the required stuff to render Vue on the server, Vue server renderer. I still kept my React code. And we'll get to that file in a second. And I call what's required to render view and what's required to render React. And then I'm going to dump them on my page. In my client, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to mount view and also mount React. Here's my app.view app code. And let's edit some of that right now. And there, boom, I added a new a little nav bar here. So I have hot module replacement, and I have two frameworks running on the same server right now. But time you know, needs change. You know, it's n nothing's forever. And the new thing comes, you've got to stay on the latest bleeding edge of JavaScript, right? So I don't know, like Vue's pretty cool, React's pretty cool, but you've got to be, um, you gotta, you got to stay ahead of the game, right? So let's take this a step further. 
Let's add Elm. <laughs> Why not? So, oops. So let's add Elm. And again, all I'm doing here to add these different frameworks is go into my Razzle config, run a function, and here's my view stuff, and now here's my Elm stuff, and I can just have at it. And let's make sure this works. So we'll add Elm here. Some Elm code. Elm's pretty cool. So app.elm, let's edit some Elm. Make sure this all works. There we go. So if you're a site like Airbnb or a site like BBC, and you're probably not going to do this craziness, but this isn't actually that far from the truth, right? So we're, nothing's forever, and new frameworks come out all the time, and everything ideally needs to be um, in flux all the time, and you want to be able to incrementally adopt things and experiment with things. And what sort of learned as I as sort of grown with the Razzle project is that that's the power of Razzle is the fact that it doesn't care about your framework. It just doesn't care at all about your decisions about how you're going to fetch your data. It doesn't care at all about how you're going to do your routing. It really doesn't care anything except the fact that you use Webpack under, uh, at, at the end of it. And that may not even be true for that much longer. Um, and so like, even crazier, you don't even need to stay in this, these like, front-end languages, per se. Um, last crazy, crazy example here. Um, how about some PHP? Why not, right? So this is, this is, this is pretty nuts. We're going to write some React in PHP. Is that really how it works? We're gonna write, yeah, I guess that's how it's working. Um, LOL.php is the name of the file. Um, so this is insane. This is some, something I found where it's called Babel Preset PHP. And it takes PHP code and it transpiles it back to JavaScript. Um, so if that's the case, why can't I just use React in PHP? Like, who knows? This is the next generation of what's to come. I, I think everybody's going to be on this grind soon. Uh, what a better, what, you know what I mean? Look, you got inline styles, everything you need. CSS and PHP. How about that? This is probably the first time anybody's ever done that, right? Um, and you get like oh, all this functionality. So let's just make sure this is running, right? So boom, some PHP code in Razzle. <laughs> let's do it. And let's see, let's make sure this, does this work, this click? Let's see, where are we here? Some React code, click. Oh, we got the alert going. Pretty cool. So to do this, I actually had to do like, OK, I took some funny comments. Um, but yeah, so we add extensions to Webpack. Babel, ex oh, sorry, Razzle exposes some helpers to make managing your Webpack stuff pretty fun. Um, so Razzle 2, actually, just, I just released Razzle 2. And there's some serious upgrades from Razzle 1. Uh, with Razzle 2, the thing you're seeing now, it's like an 800% increase or decrease in reload time, I get. Um, so it's lightning fast. And, but even cooler is that um, this is kind of a mess and kind of a leaky abstraction, what I'm showing you right now, this, this Webpack file, right? Like you kind of need to know how Razzle works. You really need to know how Webpack works. Eh, right? What if you didn't have to deal with that? So today, you can get rid of this all and do something kind of cool. Plugins, Elm, View, because this is the same app. We're just expanding on it, right? PHP and React is baked in. There we go. So this all just got reduced. I don't need any of this anymore. So now I have Elm, View, and PHP in one line of code. Server rendered application um, with hot module replacement. So, what's thinking about the theory of Razzle um, for a second here? It's important, even if you're not building this kind of specialized application, like this Airbnb type listing site or a news site, to abstract away your build tool and build tool chain from your source code of your product or product code. Why is that? One, you're going to probably have more than one product eventually in the life, lifetime of your company. And you can move this, you can rep repeatedly um, and consistently 
spin up new projects, you'll be more willing to experiment, uh, more willing to try new stuff. Furthermore, it lets you do crazy stuff like this, which is pretty fun. Um, but also, it's not going to, with the, the pace of change, the accelerating pace of change of front end, um, you just don't know what's coming next. And the best way, I think, from a, um, the best way to position yourself is to position yourself for change and for adaptability. And, you know, some people love convention. Uh, the Rails community has adopted that. And I won't say that Razzle doesn't have some conventions to it, because it does. But ultimately, you're in full control. The way I like to think about it is Razzle comes with a battery pack included, which was like the best kind of toy when you were a kid, right? You, you just, it just worked. Now everything kind of has that, right? But when you were a kid, like, oh, this toy had a battery pack included. That was awesome. But it's important to give developers, too, the ability to you know, get their hands dirty and alt have complete and total custom, uh, um, customization um, uh, control over every aspect of the application. So this is where I differ with like the Create React app philosophy, where you're forced into exactly how the Facebook and general React community wants you to do things, and then you have to eject and forego any further updates. But with Razzle v2, for example, Coinbase, Cars.com, BBC got all the updates um, for, for Razzle as well, and they were able to maintain their modifications. So that's where the power of this abstraction, this over Webpack comes, and this idea of abstracting your tool chain instead of having a boilerplate. Because ultimately, if you just have a boilerplate, one, you're probably not, your, your product, unless I'm mistaken, is probably not uh, Webpack configuring. It's just not what your company probably does. So like, save, let me handle that, and let the people who help me with Razzle handle that, and ultimately, you'll probably be better off and spend more time focusing on your product and less time focusing about like making it faster, bundling, and all the things that are kind of messy and dirty and annoying, um, and not always repeatable like product to project to project. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody here for, for coming and open it up to some questions. Sure. So, great question. The uh, Razzle's built with Create React App kind of in mind, in the sense that while you may need to make some changes to the way you route and lift up, lifting up your data fetching, uh, the CSS is the same by default from Create React App. So, um, it, you can you can make the migration. Um, it's possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you can even add it. Um, you don't even need to use Express. You can use Koa. You can use whatever you're doing to, to do that. There's another project, Backpack, of mine, which is um, something that uh, can also be used with Create React App to get a very similar um, effect as Razzle. You can use Backpack if you want to to take your single page application built with Create React App and read it and then inject whatever like, server side code you need. Um, the company Spectrum, you guys use Spectrum, Spectrum Chat like spectrum.chat, Max's application, that's what they do. They use Backpack to take their CRA app and then um, read the file and inject information into it that way. Razzle is basically the marriage of that concept together, done for you. Yeah. About your example where you like, added exclamation points and it just updated the page. Was it, was it pulling down the entire server-side page, or was it just pulling out a little snippet, but also the server-side updated if you ever uh, reloaded? That's exactly right. It pulls in, it uses hot module replacement. So on the, on the client, there's Webpack's module.hot accept. And so it's going to, Webpack will do to the best of its ability. Um, just change the code that's changed. And the, Razzle uses the same um, hot client that Create React app does. And if you go to refresh the page, um, it will obviously show that the node server 2 will have refreshed at the same time. And that's why Razzle runs on two ports. One port is for the client, and one port is for the server. Um, you can get into situations where um, the hot client will fail, and then it, will, the def it falls back to a full page refresh. Yeah. I'm curious to see like what the network traffic is between like when you make 
change? Sure, absolutely. So this one's going to be interesting. So let me zoom in on that. Let's go. Uh, oh, actually, let's not do that. Let's do it on the side so we can see the outputs. OK, so if I make a change here uh, to some React code, this is some React code. You'll see the console. So that code changed. The view thing gets kind of annoyed because of this. It thinks it's not there, but it's fine. Uh, if you want to see the network requests, um, here you go. So let's refresh the page. So this is the socket from the Webpack dev client connecting. Um, and if I make some React code changes, you'll see the hot update come in. And that looks like a mess. And those are the XHR requests, so let's see the rest of this. So let's see the actual um, the socket there. The bundle's here. The injection code is here. And this is the actual um, hot, I guess, partial part of code right here. Yeah. And this is the hot update itself coming in. So I, let's do that again so we can see it in live. So there's another hot update that just comes in and gets injected. Um, similarly, to, so once it once once a Razzle application hits and loads the first time, it mostly acts like a um, unless you do unless you want it to, it will act like a SPA if you so choose to. You can use like regular um, a tags and reload the entire JavaScript bundle every single time. Or you can hook it up with React Router or something like that and basically have it function like a client-side application after that initial render. And what's nice about that is the, the end user doesn't need to re-download the entire app on every single page. You also don't get like a real true page. Um, you'll never see this refresh button actually like change out. It's not a full page reload. So this is with this kind of hybrid application approach. And we use that all the time um, on my team um, is how we route our, our applications. And in fact, um, the after a year or so of trying to figure out how we should fetch data with Razzle, I ended up publishing a thing called after.js, which allows a similar type of data fetching technique to Next.js, but allows you to use React Router just for this kind of thing. Sure. Um, you can use Express. You can use whatever uh, Pol Polka, Koa. I'm actually going to be part of the end of my talk. I was going to switch this out for Koa. But um, yeah, I mean, you can just add, let's take away some of this. Uh, we could add body parser here. You have full customization. It's just your server. You're in control. Um, so like we can delete. And, and the second part is um, in terms of, say, data fetching, you know, to elaborate on that a little bit, like what is the best practice in terms of where you would fetch that data? You have the choice. Um, that's sort of what the impetus was for me to publish after, because it's just how we fetch data. Um, but it's specific to React. But fundamentally, the way it, the, the way it works is you need to know about your data ahead of time. And until something like React Suspense comes out, <laughs> you need to uh, know about it ahead of time and inject it from the top. And what I mean by the top, like the top of your tree, whatever that tree is, whether it's in Vue or Elm or it's in Reason, whatever it is, it's got to go coming from the top and percolate down to your application before you end up sending the code back. So you need to get to this entire markup somehow. So you need to have all the data required to generate that markup for the parts of your application you want to SEO or be rendered at least on the, ser on the server. Anything you don't need, you can just fetch normally with, you know, on the client after the fact. Um, and this is kind of the game you play, because what's interesting is that Google will evaluate your, your JavaScript. But Facebook, when to do your meta tags and your JSON LD stuff, will not. Um, when you go to share it, like Facebook will have no way to interpret your JavaScript. It's just going to use the open graph tags on your page. So um, you need to sort of play this game of um, what, fetching my data top down. And what's really interesting is that with GraphQL, with um, Again, when Suspense and React lands, it's sort of going to be more bottom up 
approaches to data fetching that will become more popular. GraphQL lets you do that now. Um, the downsides of it, right, as it stands today is with GraphQL is you, and React specifically, is you need to s basically walk through your entire tree twice. Once to grab the data and then once again to render it, um, which is not necessarily the fastest thing in the world. But um, in the future, um, with suspense, you'll be able to pause, come back, and do cool stuff like that. Um, any question? So React is the default. Um, it just comes baked in. And uh, the reason for that is that I'm not necessarily going to publish a React plugin right now is because I want to maintain backwards compat. And if I rip out that, it will probably blow up people's apps. But maybe one day. Uh, we'll be adding like, CSS plugins, SCSS plugins, things you could already do, but you'd have to configure. And because this is just a function at the end of the day, you can publish this to NPM. Uh, this is the, mo the modify functions are, and there's some cool examples like cars. You can see cars.com's uh, TS Razzle. This is cars.com's modifications, and what they add to it is pretty cool. They add um, some service worker stuff, some PWA stuff, um, and generalized um, style lint, for example. You can go to town and then publish it up to NPM, share it amongst your team, just like you would your ES lint setup or something like that. Um, again, abstracting away all the tooling. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, speaking about the other tooling, how does this interact with something like my testing framework or uh, code coverage or any of that kind of stuff? Right? I don't see a generated Webpack config. How do I pass that through kind of thing? Are you talking about for like something like Storybook where you have to like pass in Oh, the question was, how does Razzle work with your test framework, right? Sure. OK, so Razzle actually not shown here. Razzle comes with Jest set up like, for you with the same defaults that Create React App has. So um, it, that, that's for starters. You just get Jest out of the box. We use Cypress, actually. So if you were here for the last talk, we do use Cypress all the time. It's great. What's kind of interesting is we flip between Jest for our unit tests and Mocha and Chai for our um, Cypress stuff. But what ends up happening, and what's really cool, and when we're building forms, I'm working on Formic. On, um, what I'll do is I'll, put Cy I'll run Cypress, and Cypress hot reloads. And I'll, I'll run Razzle, because you want to run your integration tests, right? And Razzle hot reloads. So when you make an, if you were trying to like test a form, and you're always like, oh my gosh, I have to fill this out again, and fill this out again, and fill this out again, you don't need to do that anymore. It's just run Cypress, run Razzle next to each other, make your code changes, write the integration test, and everything just magically updates um, and just keeps going. So it, it, Razzle is as agnostic about your Webpack setup as your test framework. But again, battery pack comes included. Cool. Well, thanks again, and thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming. And thank you, BuzzJS, for inviting me. Glad this all worked out.